Welcome, everybody. It's a delightful group, and I want you to know, just looking around, how proud we are of all of you. Uh, this is the second year that we've had an event, an Alumni and Dean's Award ceremony. And we really are here to celebrate what all of you are doing, and we want to thank a couple people especially for the work they're doing and for the credit and honor they're bringing to the school, even if they're in the drone business. <laughs> uh, that's okay. We are, uh, actually, this is a wonderful moment for the Harris School. Because last December, a number of you came to our 25th anniversary celebration, which really was a milestone, hard to believe, that and I've at least met one person, one of our honorees, who can remember even before then. Correct? Yeah. But it was our 25th anniversary. We also uh, have a wonderful and exciting and talented new dean, Daniel Deermeyer, who we're thrilled to have. <laughs> you cannot fault him for not being ambitious. Because among other things he is going to accomplish for this school, he's going to double the size of the school by 2020. He's going to launch or expand a number of innovative new programs that will clearly differentiate us from our competitors. He's also actively now working to finalize plans for our new home. You saw the video in the other room. We're going to triple the size of our space. We're going to have the teaching facilities we've always wanted and the study space that we've wanted, uh, office space. It's our time. And so we're thrilled, and it's going to be a couple of years before it's done, but it's going to really help change the face of the Harris School. And by the way, while we are waiting, thanks to his energy, the dean has also gotten a commitment, which is already in process to renovate our existing facility to kind of prepare us for that next step. So that's terrific too. And we're also going to create new internships, mentorships, fellowships, and we're going to expand our alumni engagement program. I think tonight is an example of that's already in process. I just want to say again, knowing our dean's brilliant record at Northwestern, and believe me, it was a brilliant record. I am really confident that this ambitious plan he has is going to be accomplished. And I really look forward to the year 2020 in our new building when we can say, hey, we've done it and we're moving ahead still further. So, I want you to join me in welcoming Dean Deermeyer, and I also in advance want to congratulate all of tonight's honorees. Thank you, King, for these very kind words. Um, it's great to be uh, with you on this uh, not so lovely night. We had planned on a great view and um, we're right in the middle of the soup here. But um, at any rate, Welcome to the second annual Chicago Harris uh, Alumni Awards um, celebration. We're delighted to honor um, those very special individuals as they've made their impact um, in the spirit of Chicago Harris. Um, I want to just kind of share a couple of, um, of highlights um, from the last year. And uh, we started nine months ago and uh, what, a, what a year it has been. Um, we have, as, as King pointed out, we had a a very aggressive strategic plan that we discussed, developed over the summer with the faculty and with the students and with the staff and then kind of talked about that, talked about the plan um, with our board, with the visiting committee, with the alumni council. Um, for those of you on the alumni council, remember we had like coffee next door there some Saturday morning. And um, we talked to it to the leadership of the university and then we got going. And uh, it's an aggressive plan, it's an ambitious plan um, it basically is intended to position the Harris School 
over the next five to six years as the world leading policy school. That's our, that's our ambition. And in order to get there, a whole bunch of things have to happen. Um, we have to attract the best students. We have to be able to attract the best faculty. We have to have a world-class facility as the home for the new Harris. And uh, I want to say one more time, thank you to King and Karen for their generosity and for Dennis and Connie uh, that made uh, this fantastic new facility a reality for us, a dream that the school has had for over 25 years. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it has been, it, it was, uh, it was a, it has been quite a year, as I mentioned. Um, just a couple of highlights on that. We dramatically restructured the school. Uh, we have now an operating model, a structure internally that I think works much better. Uh, we've increased the student-facing staff by about 35%. We've uh, restructured the career development office. Uh, we've made dramatic progress on the alumni relations side. Um, so all the aspects, the administrative side of making a great school, I think we made great progress and we're not done with that. But we have, uh, we are, we've made an important first step, and as we're moving forward, um, those efforts will continue. Um, we have been able to attract world-class faculty. Um, just a couple of highlights on that. Some of you may know this. We were able to attract uh, Jim Robinson, author of Why Nation Fails, to the school, one of the absolute superstars in the area of economic and political development. We snatched him from Harvard, which makes me twice proud makes us better and you get, you get the idea. And uh, our, most recent, our most recent acquisition um, our, is, is uh, Konstantin Sonin will join us. Konstantin is a world-class uh, economist the, who has been working in Russia um, for the last, uh, last 20 years, 10 year, 15 to 20 years. Um, so he's a world-class academic, um, world-renowned, but he's also um, a, has been a, a brave defender of liberty and, um, and freedom in Russia, which um, had pretty severe consequences from him. He's a world expert on Russian economics and politics. When you watch the BBC and they want to know what Putin is thinking, uh, he is typically the one that they ask. And but the funniest thing I have to share with you, when he announced that he would join the Harris School, the Kremlin gave a press conference. So, uh, no joke. P Kremlin gave a press conference and in the press conference, um, uh, 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 Putin's spokesperson basically said, like, we're very sorry that, we, that we're losing uh, uh, Professor Sonin, but uh, it really had nothing to do with the political situation in Russia. So <laughs> I thought that was, a, that was a great no conference conference. So we're, we're happy about that. We're making great progress. We're, we're, we're looking at a whole variety of other aspects of the faculty. And then on the student side, um, we have been able to um, increase the size of the class, which is an important part for us in order to really create a teaching and learning environment that supports our students. And most importantly, we've been able to do that while increasing the quality of, the, of our applicant pool, increasing selectivity, and increasing yield. So what that means is we're more selective than we've ever been, and among the students that we have accepted, we're now more successful to attracting them to Harris. Um, so all the numbers in the right direction, um, this has been a tremendous success. It really has been, you know, the work of dedicated staff, literally fighting for one student at a time to make this work. But winning the ground game is important, and we have been successful on that. What's coming next is we're going to look at, uh, going to revamp our website, our branding, our marketing, which we haven't really done systematically. We're going to look at the PhD program. We're going to add new faculty. We're going to add, invest more in additional degrees, um, particularly in the area of environment and data analytics and public policy, so lots of things to come. And everybody's exhausted. So we had like, uh, you talk to the faculty and they were kind of walking like that and the staff is thinking, God, I can't wait for the summer break to come. <laughs> That's exactly what we want. Fantastic. <laughs> so um, this has been a year of great progress and momentum and there's much to celebrate. Yeah, but I can think of really no better opportunity and way to wrap up our year uh, than to take some time to recognize and honor some of our distinguished alumni and good friends. Uh, this evening, we will present two awards to Chicago Harris alumni. Um, and then we will also present a special award, a Dean's Award, to a leading practitioner who has made an indelible mark in Chicago and beyond. Um, first, I'd like to talk about the Rising Star Award. 
the Rising Star Award, the Honors a Harris alumni. It's like this thing like they have in business, like 40 under 40, that kind of thing, you know, so a rising star uh, who has distinguished herself as a leader and who have made a meaningful difference in policy. This year's we're delighted to honor Lisa Elman, who graduated from Chicago Harris and the University of Chicago Law School in 2005. Uh, Lisa has held a variety of senior positions in the executive branch uh, uh, at the White House and in the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, about eight years ago, she began working for her former law professor, kind of obscure from a university law professor called Barack Obama, you may have heard of him. Uh, in a series of presidential appointments, um, she led work on high priority policy initiatives uh, for the Obama administration and uh, issues ranging from open and transparent government and the work she's probably most famous for is uh, for the domestic use, domestic use of unmanned aircraft systems <laughs> affectionately known as drones, okay? So she is the, she's the queen of the drones and uh, most recently she said read the Department of Justice effort to develop policy that would govern the use of drones in the United States. Um, after her work in the, in the White House and in the, um, in the Department of Justice. She's been in private practice um, at the Washington DC office um, of McKenna, Long and Aldrich, where she co-chaired their unmanned aircraft systems practice. Didn't even know there was, this is amazing. First, this, this, is, this, is, this is creating an opportunity and then, fantastic, okay, so. Um, <laughs> where she uses her aspect to the federal government to help bridge the gap between technology and policy, which is one of the, one of the challenges that we have, I think, in many areas of policy, where, there's a, where they have, we have advanced technology, and then the question is, how do we really create policies in order to make this work? Uh, I, was, I was told confidentially that she is going to make a career move rather soon. She was recently profiled in Fortune magazines as part of the publication's Most Powerful Women series. Um, she's a, she's a well-thought-out speaker um, on various policy issues and uh, particular with respect to drones, law and policy and so forth. Uh, she has drafted many op-eds, she has appeared in many newspapers. She is the expert in this policy field. So we are delighted to have her with us this evening and I'd like to Lisa to come up and accept the Rising Star Award. Congratulations. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. This is wonderful. No. Um, <laughs> should I wear it? Yes, no, you can wear it. You can. Okay. Excellent. It's beautiful. Beautiful metal. I will put it on. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, thank you, Dean uh, Daniel Diermeyer and King as well, even though you hate drones, uh, we're, I still consider you a friend. <laughs> and thank you to the Chicago Harris Alumni Council and to Nikki and everyone who put this event together today. It's wonderful to be here and I'm so honored to be here with you today. Uh, it, the last several years have been amazing and it's also been quite a wild ride. And I grew up thinking that that you just planned next steps in life meticulously and it all kind of happened the way that you planned it and you knew exactly what would come next. And I've learned that things don't quite work out that way. I never would have imagined 10 years ago that my former law professor and my mentor in law school would become president of the United States. That was not a wise person's bet. I, when I worked on President Obama's, or Professor Obama then, uh, his first presidential campaign, I remember actually thinking on the campaign, uh, in terms of the p-values and probabilities that we learned here at the Harris School, that no matter what the merits of a Barack Obama candidacy were, uh, the statistical likelihood of that hypothesis being validated <laughs> had to be close to zero. So fortunately, I was wrong. Now my family often jokes, and my parents here today, um, my family often jokes that I grew up as a policymaker. I like to tell a story about when I was younger, I have two amazing younger brothers, and when we were growing up, we often drove our household to anarchy. So at the wise old age of eight years old, I designed a Magna Carta for my family's household. 
fines of 10 or 20 cents for saying things like dummy and stupid and private parts <laughs> were apparently my way of trying to create a peaceful home. Thankfully, the Harris School took my policymaking skills to a whole new level. <laughs> I enrolled here after a few years at the law school, where I really was enjoying the education a lot, uh, but I was frustrated with what I was learning. We'd read, we'd read case after case interpreting laws that didn't make any sense. And so I thought, why can't we just change these laws? Why do we have to work within the law? And that was why I decided to come to the Harris School. And the Harris School taught me exactly how to do just that. And these skills have really provided me with the ability and the flexibility to pursue my passions in all kinds of ways over the last several years. The Harris School prepped me for a life of constant innovation in every sense of the word. Perhaps most importantly, my education here prepped me to innovate in life, which is key to success in public service. On a presidential campaign or working at the White House, much of what you do is reactive. You're responding to world events and to the constantly shifting needs and desires of the American people. That doesn't mean our ideals are shifting. It just means that the breadth of issues you need to be ready to tackle on any given day is very wide. So a broad-based education is critical to handling whatever comes your way. On the Obama campaign, I was able to use what I learned in my health law and policy course here at the Harris School to de help develop policies that would later provide health care to every American. I was able to build on the education policy lessons that I learned here at the Harris School to help shape President Obama's priorities for education in our country. And I was able to represent Obama in debates and town halls based on the, my understanding of foreign policy and economics developed here. In the White House and the Department of Justice, I moved into policymaking roles focused on innovation in a very different sense of the word, bringing together the worlds of technology and policy. And the Harris School education has proved critical to my success in this domain as well. In various, rules over, various roles over several years in the administration, I drew on what I'd learned to promote American creativity that would create a more open and transparent government. I worked with other countries to reform governments and eliminate corruption. And most recently, I did work to craft policies that would enable the integration of drones into our national airspace here in, here in the United States. Now, it's interesting to me that a lot of people think that innovators and policymakers have nothing in common with each other. I travel across the country and speak frequently, and, a lot of, and I often ask folks, how many people, and I'll ask you all, how many people in this room, and I assure you I will get a very different response here in this room, but I, how many people in this room admire innovators? Okay. And how many in this room admire DC policymakers? <laughs> okay, that was amazing, and thank you very much. So generally when I ask that question, I get maybe one sympathy hand from my, my fiance here, but <laughs> nobody else raises their hand at that question. But as I like to remind people, innovation can only happen if policy paves the way. I call this policymaking, policy making that promotes innovation, and innovators working hand in hand with policymakers. Now, my idea for this was inspired partly by the forward thinking focus on policy and free markets here at the Harris School. And we're seeing the need for policymaking very clearly in the drone space right now. Now, when I first started working for President Obama almost eight years, or more than eight years ago now, drones were but a blip on the radar. Now, they are everywhere, and the policy making to govern their use is happening now. We are in the midst of drones fever in our country. We're seeing hobbyists increasingly, increasingly excited to fly drones as they have for many years. Does anyone here actually own a drone of your own? Okay. <laughs> See a fair number of people. We have some very scared folks here, so, okay. <laughs> We're seeing government agencies use drones to enhance public safety efforts and find missing hikers and increase officer safety in a cost-effective way. And we're seeing forward-looking companies designing and using flying robots to film our movies, deliver our packages, assist farmers, inspect flare stacks, and deliver medicine to rural areas. Disney even wants to use drones to replace fireworks at their theme parks or to carry lights or actual characters in the sky. 
Widespread commercial use is not yet legal in our country, but it will be in a few years. And drones raise some very important safety and privacy concerns. And policymakers are considering those right now. Now, I was tasked, when I was in government, I was tasked with leading the Department of Justice, Justice effort to craft policy that would govern law enforcement use of drones here in our country, as well as represent DOJ and the, the White House-run interagency process that would consider the policy issues surrounding the use of drones in our country more generally. I'm now in the private sector, where for the last year I've led a commercial drones practice, uh, and civil drones practice, helping universities as well as companies uh, who are very eager to use, manufacture, or operate drones here in the United States. We've just hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of seeing what the capabilities of drones are, and I think at least that it's very exciting. But for the industry to succeed, we need to use them in a way that wins the public's trust and protects its interests. And that's where policymakers have very important work to do. It's a fascinating time. Who knows what's next? Maybe flying cars? What's amazing about the Harris School of Education is that it gave me the tools to succeed and to work on whatever groundbreaking issues come our way. So thank you again for having me and for giving me the tools to succeed. I will forever be appreciative to the Harris School. Thank you. Now we turn our attention to the Career Achievement Award, uh, which honors alumni who have distinguished themselves as leaders and innovators in the public, nonprofit, or private sector. This year, we are pleased to honor Hillary Coppola McAdams. Hillary has spent the last three decades at growth stage technology companies um, in a whole of area of different areas. We have a bit of an innovation theme here, I think, tonight. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that happened. She is currently the Chief Revenue Officer at New Relic, responsible for global sales, customer success, support, and business development, where she is focused on New Relic's growth across all market sizes, um, segments, and key geographies. Um, in um, December 2014, she led New Relic's successful IPO. She most recently led Salesforce.com's World for Sales teams, focusing on growing the company's business. Um, and prior to Salesforce.com, um, Hillary was Vice President of Direct Sales and member of the Executive Committee at Intuit, where she had responsibilities along driving sales and executions of their small business solutions. And then Hillary also spent 20 years at Oracle, where you have rapidly increased sales and generated um, the business development, launched new product lines, and as a Senior Vice President of Direct Sales, uh, she drove the company's rapid growth in both the technology and application markets. Hillary has a master's um, in public policy from the University of Chicago. Uh, she also has a bachelor's degree from Mills College. She currently serves on the board of directors of Informatica, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and the SPARC program. And I want to add one more personal note to this. Um, Hillary and I met uh, when uh, we had one of our alumni events in San Francisco. And uh, one of the things I did over the last weeks is I kind of went to various areas of the country to talk to alumni. And this was always, it's always a great pleasure to meet our alumni. And, but I thought that, you know, we had a really specifically wonderful dinner there in San Francisco. I got to know um, Hillary a little better and then we had some coffee there with, with her husband Steve today. And um, in the short time that you know, we have gotten to know each other, I'm already very grateful for your support kind of moving the Harris agenda forward. So thank you for that. Hillary, please join me to accept the Career Achievement Award. Okay. You want to wear it too? Sure. Absolutely, we'll make that, we'll make that work. Okay, now I have to make, make, make sure I'm not destroying anything here. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Thank you very much. 
Well, anyone who does a little math understands that I did not qualify for the Rising Star Award, but <laughs> Lisa, congratulations, that was amazing. Um, you know, I want to thank Dean Deermeyer. I want to thank the Harris School. I want to thank Irving Harris for so many years ago thinking about creating at the time uh, the Committee on Public Policy uh, and thinking about this interdisciplinary program that needed to exist in this world to drive lots of growth in lots of different industries. Um, it's hard for me to believe that it's been 30 years since I stepped foot on the University of Chicago campus. I was 21, so now you know my age. Um, I was, I believe, the youngest member of the committee at the time of the entering students. And I arrived and I just was in awe of the possibilities, um, but I was also pretty intimidated. I think they said something at the beginning about a third of you or 25% of you won't make it through the program. And I thought for sure, well, that's probably me. You know, I'm probably one of those people. Well. That did not happen. Um, my arrival at Chicago was a random walk. So for any of the alums of the program, you know what I mean. My parents uh, took me to Harvard Square for dinner my junior year, right after my junior year in college, and said, as my mother put the Peterson's Guide to Graduate Schools on the, on the table in this restaurant, where will you go to graduate school? And I thought, oh, this is an expectation that I will go to graduate school. So I researched several programs. I've always loved business. But I decided at a very young age that an MBA was too conventional. Now, you know, in retrospect, perhaps that was the wrong decision. But given what I learned at the Harris School, I don't think that was the wrong decision at all. I think that was the right decision, a decision that my parents had always told us to follow your passions and your passions will lead you on a path in, light. So, in life. So I was thrilled when I was accepted at the Harris School. It was my first choice. I arrived, I felt I spent two amazing years there and then I moved back to the West Coast um, and entered into almost a 30 year career now in high tech companies. I joined a wonderful company called Oracle Corporation. It was a startup. It was a hundred million dollar company when I joined. I was 23 years old, the average age was 24. And just think about that for a minute. Um, I had no credentials to be there other than the unbelievable rigor and the confidence that Chicago gave me. And when I think back to what I experienced at this school, what it taught me, the Socratic method that Chicago espouses and really requires of all of its students set me up so beautifully to live in Silicon Valley in a world where it's all about reinventing the rules. And I feel like the rigor, the quantitative skills, which frankly are just foundational to the real work that we're doing, trying to create these growth companies and growth markets to change the world. It all started at Chicago, or there's something about the experience here that it just came together for me. I, um, probably some of you are wondering how many women were in tech. Not a lot, um, and, but it never bothered me. I never really thought about that because I felt so prepared for what that entrepreneurial culture. So I spent almost 20 years at Oracle Corporation. I met my wonderful husband there, my partner in crime. Um, I moved to Intuit for a couple years. I was at Salesforce where we really um, built this incredible company that was all about democratizing technology and bringing great technology to companies and organizations, including nonprofits all over the globe in a democratic manner. And we felt so good about the work we we're doing. And now I'm in an operating role at a company, a software analytics company, where we're really looking at this world of big data and thinking about what we can do with it. And that's kind of where I want to finish, is uh, looking towards the future. Um, we at New Relic, my current company, we tell our customers that your software is telling you a story. And you often don't know what that story is. And we help people unlock that story. When I think of what Harris can do around big data and policy issues, there's a story that's being collected but it's often not being shared and it's not being utilized at the rate that I think it could to influence policy decisions, 
to do better resource allocation in a world of scarce resources and to drive better outcomes. And when I look forward to the work that the Dean is doing and where I believe Harris can go, I'm incredibly optimistic. I think I see sort of a parallel to the disruptive business models of the West Coast meeting the world of policy. So with that, I look forward. I'm optimistic. I hope you are optimistic as well. I hope to meet everyone um, after the uh, formal part of the presentation and hear what you're working on. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilary, for your remarks and for being with us tonight. Our final award is the Dean's Award, which is given to a leader who is not a graduate of the Harris School. Everybody's entitled to one mistake, I think, but uh, uh, the Dean's Award honors leaders who have made invaluable contributions to public policy that align with the vision of the school's founder, Irving B. Harris. And it's my honor to present this year's Dean's Award to John McCarter. John has had an impressive career that has served the public in a variety of different roles, and he embodies, embodies the impact and leadership we strive for at Harris. Currently, he is the chair of the Board of Regents at the Smithsonian Foundation. He is also president and emeritus of the Field Museum of Natural History here, right here in Chicago, one of my favorite places for my boys ever to go to, and, a, and, a, and a, a frequent afternoon source of delight and activities that I look fond, fondly back for many years. His impressive list of service includes, among other things, being a board member of Argonne National Laboratories, the Chicago Humanities Festivals, the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, the Marine Biology Laboratory, the National Recreation Foundation, the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, and the Prize to End Blindness by 2020. He has served on five corporate and three mutual fund boards and capacities as lead director, chair of the audit committee, and is an emeritus trustee of the University of Chicago, um, a former chairman of the Chicago Public Television Station, WDTW, and he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. A native Chicagoan, he was formerly senior vice president of Bruce Allen Hamilton, president of the Cap Corporation, budget director of the state of Illinois, under Governor Richard B. Ogilvy, White House fellow under Lyndon B. Johnson. He received an MBA from Harvard, attended Lund School Economics, and graduated from Princeton. And I also like to add one more, one more personal word to uh, John as well. John and I, we met each other six, seven years ago, something like that. Um, at a program that um, at the time I was the academic director of, which was called the CEO Perspectives Programs, where we had uh, distinguished leaders from the, from the corporate and nonprofit sector. And I still remember we had, a, we had fantastic discussions there on anything from uh, the role of biotech to the role of public policy, how to think about leadership. And over the years, um, John and I, we've met in a whole variety of different roles and forms. Um, whether it has been over a dinner or during a reception or another event. And I'm particularly happy and delighted that this is the time where we can recognize your life's work with this award. It's my pleasure to recognize your many accomplishments and your legacy of public service here in Chicago and far beyond. John McCarter. It's, it's heavy. <laughs> there you go. Careful. I'm not breaking anything here. No. There you go. Okay. We're good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was going to um, divulge that relationship of being a former student of the deans. And uh, uh, we had a great time at Kellogg, but I'm just delighted that you've come south to the Midway. So. Welcome uh, to this wonderful Harris, Harris community. My family is here too, and um, I'm just delighted that they are uh, able to um, be with us this night. And 
congratulations to both of you. I just think what you've done and are doing is, uh, is wonderful. I stand in awe of that. I feel very confident in the remarks that I'm going to make tonight because I know if I make a mistake, King Harris will be here to correct any mispronunciations or misconceptions that I might have. So let, let me, I, I really want to talk about Irving Harris and um, then I want to do a little public policy wonk since you are all public policy wonks here tonight and then come back to Irving. So um, beginning, I first met Irving and we had lunch at the, on the uh, east wall, a table on the east wall of the Standard Club in Chicago. And at the conclusion, Irving asked me if I would join the board of Channel 11, which I absolutely said yes, I'd love to. And then subsequently, um, Irving invited me to join a little group called Banderlog. And Banderlog means chattering monkeys in Hindi. And it was Irving, uh, uh, others of, of that era, and the conversations over lunch were just endlessly challenging and, and fascinating. And then um, Irving invited me to join the board of Pitway Corporation, where I watched King Harris be the chairman, or the, be the chief executive officer, with his uh, father who knew far more than he did, and with his uncle who knew far more than he did, and King did just a masterful job at leading uh, Pitway. So I triangulate uh, on Irving from those three directions of public television and uh, Banderlog and then of Pitway. So then on, and this is a bit of a downer, on to policy um, issues, because I think we as a community have made a number of mistakes in functionalizing our perspective on the world. We've taken narrow perspectives. I think oftentimes we've ignored history and geography. Um, and I think oftentimes uh, we have failed in our ability to integrate all of these different functional parts of expertise in an overall understanding of an issue. So let me give you three. And again, this is, these are downers. Uh, the Middle East. Uh, here Sykes and Picot, it's the end of the First World War, and they come up with this concept of taking the Ottoman Empire and drawing straight lines to divide it. And then without any concept of terrain or religion or waterways or ethnic groupings, then we as the Western developed nations exploit the oil that becomes available in the Middle East. So we can build our uh, suburban sprawl, we can drive our automobiles, and we have no concept of the impact that we're having on the populations that exist in those states. And what are we living with now uh, in terms of the ethnic and religious strife that is going on in those countries? Downer number one. Downer number two. The great migration coming from the industrializing south into the north. So in the south, the replacement of human labor with mechanization and the great migration of African American peoples coming up to the industrial cities of Detroit and, Chicago's and, and Chicago and others. And we said, you can come, but you've got to live here. And you're not gonna go west of the Dan Ryan Expressway what was to become the Dan Ryan. And so that led to these high-rise public housing buildings. And then we said not only was housing or habitat segregation adequate, but we were going to build what were known as Willis wagons. Benjamin Willis was the superintendent of schools. And these Willis wagons were temporary schools next to those existing overpopulated schools so that we could retain segregation. And what do we wind up with? We wind up with mass incarceration. We wind up with the absence of African-American males in the community. And a situation of, again, exploitation rather than integration. 
And then the third downer, and I'm, I'm, I'll get through this, this one um, and then go to some more positive thinking. The exploitation of this planet, every nook and cranny, cutting down Indonesian forests for palm oil, cutting down Amazonian forests for soybeans and pasture, ocean acidification, sea level rising, the destruction of coral reefs, and the whole question of whether we now exceed the carrying capacity of this planet. Again, exploitation and really not understanding the local impacts and how they tote together into an overall. The tragedy of lost lives in the Middle East, the tragedy of wasted lives here in Chicago, and the tragedy of the commons. And these are three examples of these massive challenges that we, that we face as a society. So now, back to Irving. Um, and let me give you some perspective on the way I think he worked and the impact that he had. So here we are in the 1950s with a disruptive technology and economic impact of television. Irving approached this in a parallel way. First, commercially, through the acquisition of local television stations, and then publicly by the creation and development of this great system of public and educational television. So looking at a disruptive technology and then approaching it um, in two ways. Tony, which twin has the Tony? The Tony Home Permanent, which I think there are seven people in this room who know what Tony home permanents were. But using the technology in television and print, but uh, to, to convey, a again, a new world. But he didn't do that. He and King's dad, Neeson, didn't do it alone. They built a team. Uh, so they had Don Nathanson from North Advertising. Uh, they had... Um, uh, other members of the team, uh, but especially uh, including Dan Edelman. And um, we talked earlier about Edelman, which is now the largest public relations corporation uh, in the world. So number two is assembled the best team. Number three, and I think his greatest impact by far, was on early childhood development. And he kept doing this, the formation of the Erickson Institute, the Beethoven Project, the Ounce of Prevention Fund, the Yale professorships, first identifying the biology of early childhood, secondly, the return on social investment from early intervention, and then investing in multiple attacks on the problem. Irving intuitively anticipated so much of what we now know about babies' brains and how they develop, about synaptic thickness and pruning, about chronic trauma and the 30 million word deficit by the time the three-year-old disadvantaged kid uh, is that age. So there he was building on a combination of solid science and economics. And then finally, um, adding the missing ingredient. So he scanned this great University of Chicago with its college and with its wonderful graduate schools and said there is something that is missing and it is public policy. So forming initially the Committee on Public Policy Studies and now the school uh, adding the missing ingredient. So I could go on about music and art and, uh, and dance in Chicago and at Aspen, uh, investment through Harris Associates and other dimensions of this extraordinary individual the founder of the school. So now back to public policy and the lessons that I think Irving's thinking would uh, help us with. Assembling the best possible team, moving early with parallel approaches to opportunity, basing solutions on solid science and economics and identifying and adding the missing ingredients. Um, just one example which is going on now, and David and I were talking about this earlier, starting to address 
the waste from the Cook County system of bail denial and resulting in incar incarceration. So now we have Board President Tony Preckwinkle, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke, Chief Judge Tim Evans, Sheriff Tom Dart, urged on by Paula Wolf, trustee of the University of Chicago, and we're starting to see the jail populations trend down. We're starting to recognize the impact of mental health uh, in incarceration. Uh, we are starting to emphasize fairness and getting people back into their communities. The best people integrating all of the different relevant functions together to address a challenge. And similarly, we could look at King Harris's work in housing. We could look at Dennis Keller's work in African wildlife, integrating science, economics, and leadership. So toward the end of his life, um, Irving would read to me from his personal history and check facts. And then at the very end of his life, uh, we sat in his apartment one afternoon looking north up Lakeshore Drive and reflecting on times together in this great city of Chicago. I kept glancing at his housekeeper, um, wondering if I should leave, but she signaled no, stay. And finally Irving uh, started to doze and I told him I was leaving. He struggled to stand, but he did, and we bid goodbye. A week later he was gone. This is a wonderful legacy that this man has given all of us. Dean Deermeyer, welcome to the Midway, and it is a great privilege to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you to all our recipients and honorees tonight for their wonderful remarks. It's now my pleasure to invite Elena Harkness to the stage. Elena is the president of the Chicago Harris Alumni Council and she will share some highlights from the alumni weekend. Elena. Hi everyone. So I'm now standing between you and the view because I see that it's cleared up outside, but um, it is my just delight and pleasure to be here among all of you and the Harris family, um, as it always is. What motivated me to join the council, I guess three and a half years ago now, um, was the chance to be part of building it and the chance to interact with all of you that are such important nodes in that network and to learn your stories and hear from the awardees tonight. And it's just, it's just been a continuing delight and an honor. Um, so one of the things I want to talk to you about tonight is uh, something you may already know, which is Chicago Harris and the university have launched a major fundraising campaign. But in addition, they've launched a campaign that's focused on getting alumni more engaged and activated with the Chicago Harris community. So by the year 2019, our goal is to have 2019 Harris alumni who have either attended a Harris event, just like all of us here tonight, made a donation to Harris, volunteered, in any way. So if you've spoken to students, helped to organize alumni events in your city, or served as a mentor to current students, helped connect someone to a job or an internship, all of this counts as engagement. So those of you here tonight who have these one of 2019 ribbons, thank you. Thank you so much for everything you've already done. And for those of you who are here without a ribbon, this will be your last time because you'll be getting one as a result of coming to this event tonight. So thank all of you. So that's, that's terrific. Look forward to many more ribbons flourishing over time. One of the hallmark achievements of this year, we've been sort of building and growing every year as the council um, has become more established. Um, we have reunion committees, so this is really exciting. It's a chance to give alumni an opportunity to reconnect in deeper ways with their classmates and the Harris alumni community. So with the tremendous support of the Harris Alumni Relations and Development Team, we've launched official reunion programming this year. Uh, these, con these committees have already connected deeply with their classmates, encouraged them to support our flagship Harris Alumni Fellowship Fund, more on that later, and invited them to participate in all of the activities of Alumni Weekend. Celebrating their first, well, sorry, first of all, can all the reunion chairs that are here please come up to the stage to be recognized with me? 
Yay, thank you. Before I get going. Thank you. Come join me. Right. Join, join, join the party on stage. Yes, great. So celebrating their first reunion this year is the class of 2014. Their reunion committee was led by Katie Anthony. Katie? So exciting news from this committee. They inspired so many of their peers to make a gift this year that they led to a donor increase of 86% among members of the first reunion class. Thank you for leading the charge, Katie. It's terrific. The class of 2010 is celebrating their fifth reunion this year. And Chad Williams, our very own Chad Williams, <laughs> led this committee. Chad is also the president-elect of the Alumni Council, so we're very excited that he's going to be leading the charge into the future next year. Partnering together, the fifth reunion committee encouraged peers to give and got a 32% increase over past fifth reunion giving. And so everyone, the, it's harder, the older classes, to get people to give, so we're hoping for more engagement with the classes coming out, but this is a really significant increase, so thank you to Chad and the reunion committee for that. And finally, Melissa Baker led the way with the class of the 2005 10th reunion committee. 10th reunion, very exciting. Yeah. And we're very excited to announce that this committee increased donor participation by among 10th reunion classes by 80% and increased dollars raised by 27%. We do, we do love our statistics, we love our numbers, we love our percentages. So um, thank you very much. We're inspired by all your fantastic work with the, this first year of reunion classes. Um, and thank you very much for all the support. We look forward to seeing you the rest of the activities. Thank you. Thank you. So it's something to look forward to. Next year, the Chicago Harris Alumni Relations and Development Team will be hosting reunion celebrations for the following classes, 1991, 1996, 2001, 2006, 2011, and 2015. So if you're interested in becoming part of any of these reunion committees, Kelly Finzer will be here. Kelly, are you, where are you? She's outside, okay. Say hi to Kelly before you leave tonight or sometime this weekend and just let her know of your interest. Um, we're very excited to continue this fine tradition starting tonight going forward. So if you'll turn to the back of your programs now, this event, as you know, is just really the first in a series of events that the Harris Alumni Council in collaboration with the staff have put together for this wonderful weekend. Um, so we have a lot of highlights starting with the reunion dinners that will be taking place. Uh, you'll be gathering and assembling in the hall after this is finished. We have our public alumni council meeting tomorrow morning where you can come see the business of the Harris Alumni Council in action. Coffee with Dean Deermeyer and a tour of the building, and followed by a wonderful happy hour in the Chicago Harris tent from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. tomorrow. So we certainly hope that many of you will be out there to join us for one or more of these activities and to continue building this fabulous network that we've all started. Thank you so much for being here tonight, spending your Friday. Go enjoy some more drinks and hors d'oeuvres and the view, and make sure you assemble if you're part of those reunion classes. We'll see you around the rest of the event. Thanks so much.